I'd like to call our next panel up uh, to sit on the stage. So we're having a panel discussion about plant protein trends in irrigated agriculture, and we have uh, Trevor Peasy of Aniseries Processing Solutions. Trevor, if you can come on up. Trevor Lewington of Economic Development Lethbridge, and Jefferson Gardner of Inbridge, Inc. I told Jefferson he's got to change his name to Trevor. It's the only reason he can be on the panel. <laughs> kind of reminds me of the Monty Python sketch of, you know, this is my friend Bruce. We're going to start with a, uh, a brief presentation by uh, Trevor Pizzi of Anisaris. Uh He's the president of uh, Anisaris Processing Solutions, a Calgary-based engineering and project management firm uh, with subject matter expertise in grain processing. He's passionate about helping Western Canadian small and medium-sized agribusiness feed the world. To meet that objective, Anisaris focuses on optimizing clients' existing operations and facilitating capital investment in new assets. Trevor is a specialist in managing the design and construction of grain processing facilities, including navigating the complexly increasing complex regulatory environment his clients operate in. Trevor was raised on a pedig pedigreed seed farm in western Manitoba, where the family business also included the operation of a special crops processing facility and a retail crop in inputs outlet. He graduated from the University of Manitoba, where he received a BSc in engineering, industrial. His subsequent 30 years in the grain foods processing industry included leadership of Viteria's $1 billion North American food ingredients manufacturing portfolio. Today, Trevor draws on his diverse background to help agribusiness companies achieve their potential with strategic growth and operational excellence. Trevor. Thank you. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here. And sorry that I missed the um, this morning's presentation because I think there may have been some coverage of uh, what I was going to talk about as well. But I'll uh, kind of go over again some of the basics to make sure that it was covered. Um, so as was mentioned, I uh, work in the engineering and project management field in grain processing, and uh, this topic of uh, fractionation and protein trends in uh, agriculture is is an uh, area that there's been increasing interest from many of my clients and I've received a lot of uh, inquiry about you know what what does this include and how much does it cost and how long will it take to build a facility so I wanted to just cover uh, a little bit of that in the next couple of minutes and then we can take questions um, later on here. So as a business opportunity, this whole topic of protein trends, plant protein, I mean, we see more and more uh, in the retail sector and in the restaurant trade. Um, there's lots of different plant-based protein products out there right now. And many of those plant proteins are coming from commodities that we grow right here in Western Canada. Um, pea protein is one that's received a lot of attention lately, and there's been a fair bit of investment in Western Canada. Um, you maybe have heard of the Roquette plant in Portage la Prairie, Manitoba. Uh, and then there's, I've got a couple of other clients that have built facilities that are a different technology for extracting pea protein. And everybody's kind of gone through that process of understanding what's the opportunity, and then they've done analysis to decide whether or not it's worth investing, and then they go through uh, you know, a design and project management and construction phase. So as it relates to making that decision about whether it's worth investing, and I think that the opportunity is significant in this part of the province is uh, in a really good location for this because, as I said, many of the commodities that we're growing in Western Canada are sources for proteins, in particular, uh, legumes and under irrigated agriculture here, you have the opportunity to produce a broader range of legume products um, than many other 
areas. So in general, the peas, beans, um, other pulse type commodities like that. Um, and <clears throat> so it's, it generally starts with kind of looking at what the opportunity is. And as we've seen in the retail space, there's lots of, there's lots of attention being paid to it. There's lots of people buying plant-based proteins. And some of the numbers that um, we've been seeing lately are that year over year, the growth in plant-based proteins is um, seven to 10%. So it's growing quite rapidly. Um, of that, most of the worldwide plant proteins are dominated by a couple of commodities, soy and wheat, um, but those are not the fastest growing. Those big pieces of plant protein are stable, still growing a little bit, but the really high growth is in things um, like peas, commodities that Western Canada is really dominant in. And so when, we, when it comes down to understanding the process that's necessary to uh, get to those plant proteins, there's a couple of uh, basic technologies. You'll hear the word fractionation talked about. What is that? It's basically just taking a commodity and splitting it up into different component parts. So if you take a pea, for example, or a bean, there's protein in there, there's starch in there, there's some sugars in there, and these basic technologies are just taking and uh, going from a whole seed commodity and creating food ingredients that can then be sold at a higher value than the total commodity is worth on its own. That's something that up until now, Western Canada um, has done you know, some of, but we've tended to be an exporter of um, commodities and a lot of that processing happens outside of Canada. So the opportunity for us in this area is to invest more and to look at these technologies. And this area around Lethbridge and Tabor, <clears throat> you already have a fair bit of uh, commodity processing and in essence fractionation um, with potatoes, uh, with milk products. You've got facilities here that are already taking and adding value by extracting um, different components. And this fractionation technology is, is just one more opportunity um, for the area. Um, some, one of the other, actually one of the other um, facilities in town that I forgot to mention is the, the Richardson oil um, plant. So that's a fractionation plant. They're actually taking and pulling out the you know, 40, 45% of the commodity that is high value. They're left with a byproduct um, right now the meal that is lower value. And that's one of the real uh, items that needs to be assessed in any evaluation of an investment in this is uh, dealing with all of the different commodities that you produce, all the different fractions that come out. Um, up until now, fractionation was driven largely, like historically, by things like starch and oil. And protein was often just a byproduct. And that's how it's been in, the, um, in different parts of the world, in different commodities uh, for the last 20 or 30 years. Uh, whereas now the focus is turning more and more to protein being the high value component. Um, and so some of these commodities that are being invested in in Western Canada right now for um, pulse fractionation, um, it's flipped from what it was and now the starches are the byproduct. Um, I want to just touch on a little bit of some of the things that I've seen uh, from many of my clients. So as was mentioned, I focus mostly on the small and medium-sized business in Western Canada. These are companies that may do one or two uh, major projects in the lifetime of a business owner or business executive. Unlike companies like McCain's and others in town that have you know, large facilities, really significant investments, and they've got 
extensive in-house resources that help them make that decision about investing and then follow through with the execution of those projects. Um, most of my clients are smaller owners and they, they don't really do this very often. So um, one of the things that I really try and focus on with them is helping them uh, develop a good analytical process of looking at uh, understanding what the opportunity is and then going through and understanding what it is that they're going to construct and what the requirements are for that project before they decide to invest. I would say that um, generally those type of owners tend to understand the core process. So they know that they're going to build, for example, a, a P fractionation plant. And they know that they need to get some technology that's going to produce a starch fraction and a protein fraction. Um, but one of the things that's often overlooked is all of the peripheral aspects of building a plant like that. And so you have all the grain receiving and drying and you've got you know, cleaning, you've got your finished warehouse, you've got packaging, um, you may need offices, you may need uh, site infrastructure, rail siding, all those kinds of things. And I find that many times people go into a project and they believe that it's going to cost a certain amount and they believe it's going to take a certain amount of time and then as they get into the details of it, not having done that type of work before, they find that it's more expensive and it takes longer and they get to the end and they, they often haven't been able to really complete the project that they wanted to um, and they've, they've been forced to overlook aspects of their project or defer parts of their project and it doesn't really give them the opportunity to capitalize on what that, um, what that real opportunity was for them to, to begin with. Um, I think that, and we can take some questions about some of those aspects later on. I wanted to also just give you in the intro here a little bit of a sense of kind of the size and cost of some of these um, projects that are resulting in protein um, products. So that Roquette facility that I mentioned in Portage of Prairie, that will process about 125,000 tons a year of product. It's going to be between 400 to 450 million dollars for that project. Um, that one uses a technology that's called, referred to as wet fractionation. Um, so it produces a very high quality protein and a very high quality starch. And that gives them the opportunity to go after generally the human consumption market. Um, but it's a very expensive technology. And it comes with some other challenges. Uh, including water. So it uses a lot of water, 25, 30,000 liters for every ton of product that you're processing. And you have a lot of wastewater to deal with and the wastewater quality is challenging. So that adds cost as well. And on the other end, you have uh, facilities that use a dry fractionation technology where they're basically just grinding product up and then separating the particles because of different size and density. For the same size of facility, uh, like capacity-wise, you could construct a dry process for about 40 or $45 million, so 10 times the cost difference. Now, the product that comes out is not as pure, and so your product market is then limited. And most of the dry fractionation um, facilities that are being constructed in Western Canada right now are going after the pet food market. They're still highly profitable. Um, I have some financial models of those two different operations and um, on a, like a net investment basis, the dry fractionation facilities are as profitable or in some cases more profitable um, than the wet, but they're going after different markets. So I think that just understanding what the market opportunity is and then having a really solid process to go through to make your decision um, is really helpful 
and being able to know exactly what it is um, as you get into it. Uh, and then the final point that I want to just raise is uh, the matter of regulatory that was mentioned in my intro. And I think that, again, depending on the sophistication of um, and experience of the company that is doing the work, you may already be very familiar with the regulatory environment around construction. If you're not, you can get surprised at how long it may take and the amount of effort it may take to get permits in place, um, to get through that whole process before you're ever even able to start construction. Um, as an example, I'm working um, out in the Tabor area right now on that fertilizer plant and the Alberta water um, permit out there that we applied for has taken about a year um, to get approval on. So very straightforward process and delivering all the um, information necessary, but it takes a long time. And so going into these projects, it's necessary to just kind of understand that before you commit to anything. Great. Thanks. And we'll hear more from Trevor in a moment once we uh, start the panel discussion. Uh, Trevor Lewington is the Chief Executive Officer of the Economic Development Lethbridge. Together with a 25-member volunteer board of directors, Trevor is proud to work with a talented team that develops and delivers on initiatives to promote the Lethbridge region. It has an excellent place to live, work, visit, invest, and do business. Trevor has 15 years of executive management experience in the food processing industry. In addition to many years of living the trials and tribulations of a small business owner, combined with additional roles in the public sector. He holds a Bachelor of Commerce with a major in Human Resource Management, completed a Change Leadership Certificate with Cornell University, and is a Chartered Professional in Human Resources through CPHA Alberta. He's been recognized as a Senior Certified Professional by the Society of Human Resources Management, and is also a Certified Logistics Professional through the Canadian Institute of Traffic and Transportation. He has accredited insights, a discovery client practitioner, delivering training on communication, team, and leadership effectiveness. He's engaged and involved in his community and has served as the deputy mayor in the village of Sterling and currently serves in the role of mayor. Trevor is a member of the advisory board for the Dillon School of Business at the University of Lethbridge, is an active member of the board of directors of the Plant Protein Alliance of Alberta, Economic Developers of Alberta, Economic Developers Association of Canada, as well as the Lethbridge Hurricanes WHL Hockey Club. Trevor. Whew, that was a mouthful. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for being here. How many of you from out of town came in for the conference, not from Lethbridge, show hands? Awesome, I'm an economic developer, so spend lots, visit our restaurants, come to our stores, uh, visit our cultural facilities. We're pleased to have you here in town. We appreciate the organizers for being here in Lethbridge uh, for this event. So I'm an economic developer. That means it's my job to prostitute myself around the world to bring investment to this region. And for that purpose specifically, of course, the number one sector is food. That's our area of expertise. So I represent a group of five economic development organizations, five municipalities in this region. And we've formed an area called Canada's Premier Food Corridor. So that's a region here in southern Alberta. And the reason it's here is because we have not only the raw commodities and supplies, the, the ingredients that are needed, we have the processors, world-class, global-scale companies that do the work. And then we, of course, have both public and private R&D folks, like our post-secondary institutions, that are helping support and grow those industries. So we have all of the right ingredients in this region to do something that I lovingly refer to as TWD. So if you've ever heard me speak ever, I use those three letters all the time. And it's because this region and this province in particular has a real opportunity for total world domination uh, on commodities and on food in particular. And let me tell you a little bit why. So again, this is the region. Uh, it stretches basically from the city of Lethbridge out to uh, Tabor and a little bit beyond. So it's the municip municipalities including the MD of Tabor, the town of Tabor, the town of Coldale, the city of Lethbridge, and Lethbridge County. These are all of the partners. You've got a little bit of our propaganda, I mean information, in the folders that came with your package here. So again, if you're happy to ask and answer any questions on that later, you can certainly go to our website. 
But we're very focused on this food opportunity, and here's why. And these are graphs that I'm sure won't surprise you, but population growth uh, has had this hockey stick curve, right? We've seen gigantic leaps in population. We're now trying to feed 7 billion people in the world, and that's only going to continue to escalate. So we have this gigantic opportunity to feel, feed a growing population. And as countries raise their incomes, what do those diets look like? Well, just as most of our baby boomers are retiring and maybe cutting back on the red meat, you know, self-imposed or otherwise by your doctor, other parts of the world are trying to emulate our diets. So as North Americans in particular, and to an extent Western Europeans, are moving away to more plant-based alternatives, other parts of the world with population growth are actually seeking alternatives. Now to be clear, I'm not anti-beef, because I recognize that 60% of Canada's beef production happens in a very small corridor just north of here, and plant-based proteins are important for animal feed as well. So the opportunity here is to meet consumer trends towards plant-based proteins, the opportunity is to meet global requirements for additional sources of protein, and that includes more exports of animal-based proteins as well. But the opportunity right now is in the plant-based, and here's why. As that population grows, it's happening in an area of the world that's not here. So we have a real opportunity to grow our exports, and you can see that in Asian markets, the population will see a bit of a curve down as the bulk of the population eventually dies, uh, because they're older than we are. In Africa, we see that that percentage, that split continues to grow. So most of the demand globally for food is not going to be here. It's going to be in those two areas of the world. And that's where incomes are rising the fastest, right? So relative to our position today, of course, incomes are very low, but it's growing by leaps and bounds in those areas. So you have this population demand, you have this, this requirement to feed the world. We also have this thing happening that relative to other parts of the world, climate change could be a good thing for our agriculture sector. Now, I know who I'm speaking to here. However, there will be longer growing seasons. There will be more heat units in this part of the world. So with the, white, the right water infrastructure, there is expected to be a net gain of agricultural productivity in Canada relative to other parts of the world. So our markets to supply are not here and if you look at that particular graph, the red colors or the pinkish colors are places where climate change will have negative impacts on agricultural capacity. So the areas of the world where the population is growing the fastest also have this countervailing trend where they actually will have less production capacity as a result of climate change. So I always operate under the philosophy of never waste a good crisis. That's not good news for them, but it is a market opportunity for us. And in Canada, the federal government has recognized that agriculture and agri-food is one of the single largest sectors in our economy. So agri-food actually employs more people than any other sector. So people in Ontario like to get bent out of shape uh, uh, you know, around the automotive industry, but agriculture and agri-food is actually a bigger employer in this country. And relative to GDP, you can see that it's one of the top sectors, right? So agriculture is a driver for our country. For Lethbridge specifically, and that's the city of, Agriculture and agri-food drives about 20% of the city's economy. So even though there's not a lot of arable farmland inside the city boundary, it's still one-fifth of our local economy is all derived from, from agriculture. So it's of huge importance to us. The plant-based uh, protein opportunity, again, is around this idea that global population, particularly in the middle class with disposable income, is growing. Western diets are changing. For good or for bad, people are wanting these protein alternatives. And then you think about the growth in other sectors, there's a need to provide uh, supplies to livestock, companion animals, and everything else. Love this line that comes from Protein Industries Canada. Think about this statement. The world will need to produce as much food in the next 45 years as it produced in the last 10,000. Think about the magnitude of that challenge in terms of feeding this population. So why are we excited about that? Again, Alberta in particular, Southern Alberta, we have the production capacity. We have innovative farmers, we have this research community, and we have the international reputation. I mean, I do travel uh, to try and sell our products and our market around the world. I was just in France in December. I was on a vacation, to be fair. No tax dollars were harmed in my particular travels. But I'm a nerd, so while I was in Paris, I went to the European Food Ingredient Show, because that's what you do when your spouse ignores you most of the time and says that's not interesting. As an economic developer, you go to food shows. And I will tell you that there were 22,000 people that went through this show, and there were almost 4,000 companies 
uh, bearing their wares, and Canada had a very small presence. So I spent a lot of time unfurling the Canadian flag on my back and running around the place trying to drum up some business. But we have an opportunity. We have all of the right ingredients. It's how do we take that forward? So that's what we're excited about. Um, I can tell you that in the last five years, for Lethbridge specifically, we've seen just over a billion dollars worth of development. A lot of that, however, was institutional. So the university uh, project, the destination building, would be an example of that. The next five years, we're looking at just over a billion to a billion and a half dollars worth of development that's in the pipeline. Most of it is in the agri-food space. Uh, so, you know, that's good news, I think, in terms of that's private industrial development, that, that those are all good things. But they all are going to need water to run their processing plants. And they're all going to need inputs that require water as well. So, again, that hockey stick curve for population growth, for food demand, just translates down into the work that you all do. So to summarize that in a much better way than I possibly could, I have a short video clip for you if, if the technology gods cooperate. And the gentleman that's speaking, his name is Dr. David Hughes. He's someone uh, that we've worked with quite a bit. He's based in the Imperial College in London, in England. Uh, but he's a very enthusiastic, as you'll see. I actually play this video every time I get out of bed. Uh, some people have an alarm clock. I actually use Dr. David Hughes to get me out of bed because his message is just so heartwarming. I hope that you, you know, we find it interesting as well. But listen to kind of what he talks about and how he weaves that message together. And if I could get him to move here, he'd be like the chief sales officer. So we'll see if we can run that. Hi, I'm David Hughes, and I spend 300 days a year talking around the world about global food trends and looking for really interesting food innovations. For years, we've been producing some of the best food in the world, trucking it to ports and then sending it to countries where they exact the true value. We can't continue to be the low-cost producer, and why should we? It's time we added much more value at home. Consumers want more protein in their diet, and what's more, they want more plant protein. And we want plants not just for food, we want them for bioplastics, for renewable energy, for pharmaceuticals, and for a host of other consumer industrial goods. Does milk come from cows? Sure, but it also comes from soy, rice, almonds, and now from peas. Brilliant. Plant protein demand is booming all around the world. Why? It's seen as tasty healthy, it has few clean ingredients that we can pronounce, it's particularly good for weight management, it's produced by farmers, real farmers, not factory farmers, and with pulses they put more back into the soil than they take out. We now have the technology to break seeds down to the sum of their parts and extract the very proteins and micronutrients that are essential in the manufacture of specialty high-value foods. We have substantial R&D and pilot plant facilities in Alberta, Saskatchewan and Manitoba and the advantage of world-class universities. It's really important for us to move from R&D to commercialization, to become world-class food ingredient suppliers and not just world-class commodity suppliers. There are countries around the world that are doing much more in terms of adding value. Why aren't we doing more in the prairie provinces? Plant proteins are having a moment in the fast-changing food industry of the 21st century. There's real opportunity out there. However, you've got to act on those opportunities and take it and convert them into commercial reality. It's a pretty passionate uh, person. Uh, our next panelist is uh, Jefferson Gardner of Inbridge Inc. Jefferson is co-founder and CEO of Inbridge Inc. As a certified blockchain expert and researcher, Jefferson and his team explore the impacts of emerging technologies, how they will integrate with each other and improvements to our world. He has worked in 10 industries, seven countries, consulting with foreign governments and large corporations in the areas of operations, strategy, marketing, automation, concept development, and technology. Inbridge focuses on improvements in agriculture, manufacturing, supply chain, among others. Jefferson. So Trevor, the middle one, or the one to this side, we have an ongoing bet of seeing how quickly someone can talk during a presentation. So grab the seat belt that's conveniently located under your seat, put it in and hang on, because this is going to be an interesting. So 
a lot of people think that I come and I talk about emerging technologies with respect to the industry, but I am sitting here trying to get an appropriate education into what emerging technologies are and how they integrate or converge into each other to optimize our systems. So at this point, I have 10 hours of instructional session speak that I usually do, and I'm going to fit it into this less than 10 minutes. So starting, let's do the ABCDs. A lot of people look at A as artificial intelligence. We look at blockchain, which I'll talk about here. Computing, essentially the speed at which you can process. And data. We at Inbridge, from a consultancy standpoint, know that you can't just go in and start with artificial intelligence. You can't just go shove blockchain in somewhere. It doesn't make sense like that. So we start looking at your data. Data is the fuel that f uh, feeds this system and maintains it and keeps it operational. Then we look at your computing needs. If you have tons of data, but you don't have the processing power to do anything with it, then we have to look at what kind of computing infrastructure we have to upgrade to. Then we look at blockchain. Blockchain, sometimes people will say, and they're full of it, that blockchain is a panacea. It's going to fix the world and everything. It's not always going to do that. Sometimes when clients come to us, they go, we need blockchain really bad. And the first thing that I say is, are you sure? Because a lot of times there are companies out there that will shove blockchain in and tell you you have to have it. And sometimes just traditional databases are absolutely fine for your operations. But blockchain is definitely one that can be optimized uh, within protection, which I'll talk about. Then we look at the AI. Now, just to scare you, here's all the little back-end computing, coding that goes into all of these different functions. So data. One of the core problems that we're looking at in all industries is back in 2017, they predicted that in the next five years, we'd have 800% increase in the amount of data that we're collecting. One of the core issues, though, is 80% of that is going to be unstructured. And what I mean by unstructured is if you look at uh, that thousand piece puzzle that you bought from the store and you shake it onto the desk, well, you've collected all the pieces, now you've got to figure out how to put them together. So from a data perspective, when you have unstructured data, it's like you're storing this data and it's costing you a bunch of money, but you're not getting anything out of it. So how do you structure it in a way that you can use it to draw insights from, to optimize your operations, and increase your overall productions? So quantum computing. Now, there's a few of you that might get lost in the nostalgia of the late 80s, early 90s, and might be singing the theme song to Quantum Leap. That's not what this is, but we're close. Uh, quantum computing essentially is a processing. It's a speed at which something can process. Uh, back about a couple of years ago, we said that quantum supremacy, which is basically quantum computing being significantly better than our current computing systems, would be not broken until 2026. That was what we were predicting. Well, about a year ago, Google uh, successfully were able to reach quantum supremacy. And so the future is now. And there's a lot of uh, smart people that are working on this problem. Now, the 100 million there is to give you perspective. Quantum, in theory, once it reaches its efficiency, should be able to process data 100 million times faster than current computing systems. What's interesting about that, and to give you some perspective, is if we had enough data, just a random data set that took regular computing systems today 3.17 years to process, a quantum computer could do it in one second. So there's a lot of things that are coming in our timeline here, and some aren't quite there, and we're, we're, we have these problems, and we're having to solve them, and quantum is definitely one of those big solvers. Now moving on, now we look at blockchain. So blockchain, I just call this, this is the zebra of the database family. So people who know databases, there's pretty standard databases. The biggest difference between blockchain and the current style database is that databases you can put data in, you can delete them out. For some people, this can be very difficult because if I don't trust the person that's putting the data in or I don't trust the person who's managing that data, they can delete it out, change it, manipulate it. When you have a supply chain, a number of stakeholders, guess what? They don't always trust each other, and that's a fabulous place to be. <laughs> so blockchain is here to help bring trust back into the equation. So the, the difference with blockchain is that you put data in and it cannot be deleted out. So what is a block? There's a lot of mysticism out there. People talk at a high level about what blockchain is, and they miss the mark heavily. So what I'll say is just a block is simply a, a file where transactional information is. If you think about it kind of like a Microsoft Word document, you fill that document up. If you're wanting to send that to somebody, what would you do if you didn't want them to edit it? You'd convert that into a PDF. So that's not precisely what this is, but it's similar. This is a metaphor to kind of help you understand what that is. So it's just a file that's closed, has a certain amount of data, it's found inside. But where does the whole chain thing come from? Well, the nice, interesting thing is blockchains are chronological. It's a history, and it's a chain, basically is a sequence of blocks that are linked together, and there's, I won't get into it, but there's a bunch of really cool technical stuff that goes on that maintains the security and consensus within this system so that nobody can man manipulate it without the rest of the groups knowing what's going on. 
So then we look at artificial intelligence. This very literally is a simulation of human intelligence. Uh, if you look at this, we have a number of lentils, peas. From a visual standpoint, we can train artificial intelligences if we give them enough data. And I could throw this out to the poll in the room and say, you know, name, name those lentils, name those peas. And some people could go, okay, well, this one's this, really quick. But an AI, if it's trained appropriately, could label these immediately within fractions of a second. We're seeing AI in farming where it's able to fly over certain fields, recognize uh, invasive species of herbs or pests, and actually recognize those things and notify. So these are really important things. What I will say about artificial intelligence is without data, it's absolutely useless. Uh, basically, it'd be like putting an infant in the middle of the room, hitting it with a bunch of stimulus, and expecting the infant to know what to do. That infant doesn't have the historical time frame um, to receive and be put in situations of experience in that regard and would not understand how to process that. So artificial intelligence absolutely can't be without data. So then, as I do this, I always compare this to a biological human system. I find it the easiest way to teach because you know, I just talked about artificial intelligence, I talked about blockchain, I talked about data, all these different things, but how do they all come together? And if you think about your own body, you have a brain. And there's certain instinctual processes you have, but there's also systems when you are experiencing something. And I always give this examples. When I was a kid at my grandma's house, she babysat me lots, those heat elements on the oven, for some silly reason as a kid, I was like, wow, that's really bright and red, I'm just gonna And then I would scream and run, and then I'd put my hand in a cold, um, dish for a while. You'd think I would stop it the first time, but I was like, you know, well, it's not as red as it was. It's a little orange. Maybe I'll try it again and throw my hand on there. Well, guess what? It's still burnt. you think I'd be smart enough at this point, but I was really trying to exercise my own artificial intelligence, and I saw that it went really dark, but I'm like, hmm, it's kind of radiating some heat. Maybe it's not hot anymore. Threw my hand on there. Well, guess what? I didn't do it again, uh, and, and I learned that it doesn't matter if, if it's just been on. Be careful. So this is the whole aspect is that it's a consciousness. Artificial intelligence kind of sits in the front end of most systems and sees data as it comes in and processes it and based on historical data can make assumptions or responses based on that. Blockchain I reference as the memory bank. So this is where we can store information and we can retrieve it as we need it. Then we have the internet of things, which I haven't talked about too much in depth because it's very simply your nervous system in that respect. So if you look at you know, a farm uh, or a supply chain, you can see how these systems can be integrated. We can literally bring sensation, because the Internet of Things basically is a connected sensor or system that's retrieving some sort of data from out of our digital system and sending it back to the artificial intelligence to process and then store within the blockchain. So these IoT systems, as we integrate sensors within our operations, we can actually optimize and improve and remove human error as well as human manipulation out of the equation because these Internet sensors uh, Internet of Things aren't motivated by the same subjective or emotional context that humans are motivated by. Quantum then becomes the EpiPen. Now this isn't just like one poke and you're good. It optimizes the whole system. It speeds it up very quickly. It's kind of, kind of like a constant drip of epinephrine. As we move on, here's just a quick comparison. Artificial intelligence, conscious brain, Internet of Things is the nervous system, blockchain is a memory bank, and quantum is epinephrine. So what's necessary to feed these systems? As I mentioned earlier, data. If you don't have data, you don't have anything. But what about these smart contracts? Some people think, and I've heard about smart contracts with respect to blockchain. I'm going to give you a very quick example. Traditional contracts look like this. You have a lawyer in the middle, and you have two parties, and they're both giving information to the lawyer, and that lawyer is then creating this contract. One of the core issues is if you're in a contract between a producer and a manufacturer or a processor, you have the person in the middle going, well, do I know the weather conditions? Do I know the date and time and when these things are going to arrive? You know, did it actually sit in port for a while? Um, what, and what is the actual amount of money that I'm paying? Well, you can see in these infographics that we have transport, manufacturing, more transport, and the final destination. Well, one of the core issues that you run into here is that on the left, one member of the contract is going, yeah, we fulfilled everything. Everything's great. On the right, this guy's going, eh, no, I have two discrepancies. And then we get into litigation. And everybody's favorite word in the industry is litigation. <laughs> I think anybody loves it. You know, people want to avoid it. And this is what smart contracts can do. It removes and limits the amount of litigation that can come in. And it will require a little bit more of solicitation beginning. So that little big thing that looks actually like the burner I used to put my hand on when I was a kid, that's actually a symbol for connecting uh, a system or sensor. And we can connect things to recognize information, data, weather, conditions, geolocation, and time. So as we connect through all of these systems, we can create uh, a fully integrated, almost 
uh, biological system within our physical and digital world that educates this contract. And you can precondition these contracts above. And so if you look at this, we have a, what's called a smart contract, a little contract up there. The two individuals in the middle have put their information, have agreed on that information, and it's in the smart contract. And these sensors are educating that contract on when those conditions have been fulfilled. Well, when that product lands in the end destination, uh, it can recognize based on geolocation, it'll tell that contract, hey, we've satisfied all the demands, both parties are satisfied, and then can distribute money automatically opposed to educating your accountant and getting all that stuff done. So smart contracts work on the backbone of blockchain, and that's where the security comes from. Now, I am going to close down and hopefully move into this next session, but uh, thank you. Some of the things we've heard about is the first presentation, Trevor, is some of the hurdles, the cost, the high cost of, of getting into a fractionation. How can those costs uh, be decreased or avoided? And perhaps uh, then we'll have our other Trevor talk about that from a municipal economic development standpoint of, you know, what are municipalities doing? What's this region doing to attempt to deal with lowering those costs for uh, for people who either want to get into that industry or to attract that industry uh, here to the Lethbridge region. And then, uh, Jefferson, you're going to fill us in on, from a tech standpoint, uh, what systems can be put in place to reduce that cost for a person either who's coming to Alberta or decides, hey, I want to get into this business. So, so I think that one of the... Um Is this on? Okay. Um, I think one of the uh, key things to understand when we're talking about construction is that uh, the ease of making changes is relatively high before you start constructing anything. Um, so when you're in a planning phase, when you're in a design phase, it doesn't cost very much to make a change. If you wait until you're in the middle of a project and then you figure out that you want something different than what you defined in your requirements going in, it is going to cost a lot more. So my guidance on keeping costs low is that the basic technology is, has a certain cost. You're not going to change that. Um, but by thinking carefully about what your requirements are going into your project, taking the time to define that and to work um, through that planning process, you're going to save a lot of money in the end. Yeah, I think from a municipal perspective, there's a couple of things. I saw a number of municipal leaders in the room. One is, you know, cutting red tape and velocity. So if I'm a, a large manufacturer and I know that the project, um, as we had, we got one approved in less than two months that was going to take more than a year in another jurisdiction, that's a, ye a, a year of lost construction, a, a year of lost sales. That's actually probably the single biggest thing that municip municipalities can do is not lower your standards, but make sure that that process is fast and easy and, and something that uh, processors can do. You know, there's not a lot you can do necessarily to offset capital costs. I mean, th in the US in particular, economic development is about writing checks. And, you know, there's a bit of a race to the bottom. You've probably seen all kinds of horror stories about how municipalities compete. But things that you can do here you know, is, is some of those input costs. We want a great labor force. We want to work with our post-secondaries to make sure you've got the right skills. But in particular, things like water and electricity. So in Lethbridge, for example, uh, the city owns the electrical distribution system. So the tariff rates for your transmission and distribution costs on your electrical bill, which are significant, about 60% of your power bill is actually not power if you look at your home bill. In Lethbridge, our industrial clients are paying 7 to 12% less than most other places in the province. Well, that adds up pretty quick. In my previous life, I was paying more than a quarter million dollars a month for power across three plants. So you know, 7% is a big number. Same thing with water. So in Lethbridge, we have a descending rate block structure. So the more water you use, actually the cheaper per unit cost on a cube of water. And so, for example, in Lethbridge, you know, some of our largest industrials are paying about 54 cents a cube. 
in Calgary, they're paying $1.50 per cube. So there's some things we can do that you can specifically address industry's needs, making sure, of course, we pay back the assets and we break even. It's not about giving away the farm. Um, but, you know, what are the things that are going to matter to those businesses and wh what makes sense from a business development perspective in the city? I would speak to, in supply chain, you get network design or network redesign, and as we are seeing transition from old technology to new technology, back in the 90s, early 2000s, they analyzed individuals who transitioned from Excel documents into a true database system and digitization. And what they were able to do is map out that their return on investment was successful within 18 months. A lot of people, the reason why they don't want to implement these technologies, they go, wow, that looks like a little bit of a hefty cost up front, but they don't realize what costs it reduced or the potential for um, reducing the amount of litigation that is also a natural cause within the system. And automation is a step that we look at is here's 100% of your problem. Well, we can't just go and say, okay, well, we're going to do something to fix 100% of it. We have to then approach it from a very analytical standpoint, a root cause analysis, and go, okay, well, we're going to fix 20% of this and we're going to reassess it. And we're going to close that gap all the way. And what we find is that the more that you can remove humans in certain respects, and a lot of people freak out and they go, ah, you're killing jobs. Well, it's a lot of job migration. Um, people are going to have to adjust to the demands of the marketplace. But as we re relieve people from certain points within those systems, you reduce the amount of human error. And honestly, when you analyze within any op operations and management systems, human error can cause and will cause some of the most and biggest losses. Where these systems, uh, when you put a hardware system in there to educate or transfer information, you actually relieve the subjectivity of the human. And the only comparable that I can sit there is anybody that's watched Willy Wonka in the Chocolate Factory, they're trying to find those five golden tickets, and there's a scientist pugging into a machine, you know, where are the, where are the golden tickets? And the computer basically says, what in the world would a computer do with a lifetime supply of chocolate? Different motivations eliminate that motivation, and you eliminate the potential for human error and manipulation in that error. So one of the other issues is investment. How do we get or attract investors into this industry? So uh, I think I've got a quote from uh, Trevor Lewington here. It says, I read this from the newspaper, approximately two to 3,000 people are directly employed in agriculture with 900 farms in the region, generating 1.1 billion every year or around 20% of the local GDP. Now, Lethbridge area has done a pretty good job so far. You've got Cavendish Farms, McCain's, PepsiCo, Richardson's, Sunrise, Maple Leaf, Roxburn, Agriport, Cheese. How do we go about and show that this is an industry which people need to invest in rather than typically what do you think about Alberta? It's oil and gas, right? We know what that climate's like for investment right now. How do you focus on ag? A great question. I mean, that's most of my life. I, I will tell you that there's, you know, there's, there's some baseline things. Obviously, you have to have access to markets and highways, but it, it really comes down to a couple of core things. So number one is the core infrastructure. So, you know, many municipalities will beat up on their economic development officers and say, you know, why haven't you landed me a blank factory? And the, and the, the reply should be, well, if I had them in my office, what would I show them? Right? So most companies are not willing to wait six months to a year while you develop industrial land that has servicing. There's an expectation that when I show up at your door, there's a place for me to go. And that means upfront investment. So that, that's why a lot of municipalities shy away from that. So good, bad, or indifferent, you know, Lethbridge has added another 400 acres of serviced industrial land at a cost of about $20 million. And that's going to sit in the ground and collect dust. Nothing's going to happen. But when people show up, we can just literally turn on the switch. So that's, that core infrastructure is important. And the number, the number two thing that always comes up is around quality of life or workforce. So first of all, your community has to be a place where people want to go, right? So if, if a plant is going to employ people, are there enough affordable rental units in your community that they could actually live there? Because if they can't, no company is going to want to have to recruit people and then bust them from somewhere else. Uh, likewise, if they're going to land a very high technology, highly automated plant, are there post-secondary institutions that have a steady stream of talented people that can be molded and developed and brought in? So having those key ingredients that really don't have a lot to do necessarily with the industry, but are crucial to having all the right ingredients. And there's a big long list. There's a, an organization, uh, it's called the Site Selectors Guild, and they actually develop a top 10 list every year. And it changes every once in a while, but the top three or four items are almost always the same. So, you know, if areas or organizations are wanting to figure out, you know, focusing on those top three or four, 
uh, that's that's usually the recipe for unlocking investment. Uh, Trevor Peasy, uh, you've dealt with clients who have been out there seeking investment. Uh, what sort of things specifically are investors looking at when they're evaluating an opportunity, particularly in relation to fractionation? Well, as I said, I <clears throat> deal mostly with the small and medium-sized um, owners or investors. So I think that one of the things that they are trying to do often is to keep control of their business. And it's one of the challenges that they face is that, um, you know, uh, someone who's a, a farm level operator and wants to invest in something like this, it's a multi-million dollar um, decision for them. And it's sometimes or quite often not something that they're prepared to uh, to fully fund themselves. And when they're looking for an investment partner, um, if the investment partner is putting in a significant amount of equity, then they want a fair bit of, of say in how the business runs. And I, I think that that is one of the challenges that um, that my client base faces. Um, and I think that many investors, um, you know, outside investors are looking for a fair degree of confidence in, uh, in the project. And one of the challenges in the uh, protein, plant protein space right now is that it's a relatively young industry. And a lot of these, um, a lot of these commodities that are being produced, food ingredients that are being produced, uh, don't yet have a fully developed market. And that's, that's something that is also just a little bit of a barrier to getting some of these projects going because it's, it's kind of a chicken and egg scenario where you go to a large food manufacturer, a Kellogg's or a Post Ingredients or something like that, and you're trying to sell them um, a product that you're not yet producing because you want confidence that they'll buy it before you invest. But on the other hand, they're not willing to invest in food formulation until they have a supply chain out there that, you know, that they're not just locked into a single supplier, that there's some... Um, some confidence that that if something goes wrong with one supplier, that there's another backup for them. So it's a it's a tricky situation to get investment part partners into. Thank you. Uh, just dealing with the tech aspect, uh, you know, we, we talk a lot about exporting our our proteins out to the world. How do we keep track from a, a from a quality perspective. I mean, we've known the trade disputes with China says it's contaminated, we don't want to touch it. How do we deal with that from a technology perspective? I'll try and answer that question from an uh, experience that I had. So we engaged with a number of, well, there's this woman in STEM fund that uh, economic development actually was able to achieve through Tech Connect, and there was a number of women both at the university, the college, and at a high school level that we brought together and educated on emerging technology. And then we took them out to a blockchain AI hackathon in Toronto, and just so everyone in the audience is aware of the quality of the individuals from this city, is we went out there, there was Russia, China, Romania, Ukraine, all these different countries from all over the world that were attending and, and hacking, and our team took third. And the problem that they proposed was this issue with China and canola. And you have this massive issue where you have, oh, c contaminant. And, you know, I think most of us in the room will agree that this is more of a geopolitical fighting thing than an actual contaminant that was found. But how do we prove, how is there provability within our systems? And based on what I explained with the smart contract, you can have these sensors. And so we proposed a, a solution where in the train rail systems, we would have sensors that would recognize moisture levels, contaminant levels. There would be sensors that would recognize how often the lids were opening up and closing. And then there would be transport query stations where data that's collected in those sensors would then be transported to a hardwire system at a transitional point and then collected and, and verified within the blockchain. But within blockchain, you have all these individuals who are coming in and are helping with the consensus uh, of it and verifying all the data that's inputted into it. And so essentially the, the system that we implemented or proposed and then hacked and actually developed in 24 hours uh, could solve the canola issue across Canada. And that's why they got third place, because they solved a major problem. I think going to some of their point is we have this succession issue within agriculture. 
you know, who are the people who are going to take the lead. Um, I work with the agent program at the college, and a lot of these kids, when they get in there and they realize what can be done with technology in agriculture, they get all excited. And they go, wow, like, I can't believe it. And I think agriculture has a, a, a lack of sexiness problem, and it's going to bring back sexy, uh, because you have all these kids who are realizing how to implement these new systems, and the, the team that we took out there, once they realized what they could do and how quickly they could do it, and solve real world problems, it just got them excited. And now all, for the most part, the majority of them are still engaged in trying to solve these things. Great. I think we've got time for some questions. If you want to ask any questions, we've got about five minutes. So if you want to go to one of the mics, we'd, uh, any of the panelists would be happy to answer them for you. Uh, Brian Bruin. Um, I got a bit of a pet peeve. Why are the roquettes and stuff uh, going to um, Manitoba? What is Alberta lacking that Manitoba uh, has? Well, specifically the, with respect to roquette, I think one of the key elements there, I, I lived in Portage de Prairie for 25 years, so I'm quite familiar with the town. Uh, one of the key elements that Portage de Prairie has is uh, an oversized and highly capable wastewater treatment facility. Um, there is two large potato processing uh, plants in town, and there's an existing wet pea fractionation plant in town. Uh, traditional wet pea fractionation uh, disposes of about eh, close to a third of all the raw material that comes into in the plant, goes down the drain. Um, so it's quite a challenging wastewater um, stream to work with. And in that case, my understanding, I'm not involved in that project, but my understanding is that cl between 15 and 20 percent of the total project cost of $400 million is Roquette's investment in wastewater treatment, plus the province provided, I forget how many millions of dollars, but it was multi-millions of dollars to the city of Portage de Prairie as part of the attraction as well. So there's been a massive upgrade to what was already a really significant wastewater treatment plant. Um, and other fiber processors that looked at building plants in North America a number of years ago, again, Portage was one of the sites, one of the few sites in Canada or the U.S. that was really prepared to deal with the wastewater stream. Okay, we probably have time for one more question. If not, we'll conclude and go to our copy break. Thank you very much. Really appreciate this.